Let's get this party started. Um, Amanda was asking if we're still sending out the slides. Uh, and I guess I should probably provide some clarity on that. Um, for those of you that aren't using Outlook, let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, each individual presentation uh, has the slide for that particular week uh, sent after the presentation is given. So you'll find New Zealand under last week's. Uh, once we finish up today, then we'll have sake added on to today's. Hope that provides a little clarity. All right, let's rock and roll. <clears throat> Obviously, the date is incorrect on this. Uh, I wrote this uh, previously. Uh, here's a map of Japan, and uh, I think it's important for us to start to really kind of hone in on uh, what we know about Japanese uh, GIs for sake uh, in particular. I think it's important that we talk about wines with a sense of place. If I told someone that um, I was selling them northern coast California Cabernet Sauvignon, they would be very curious as to whether or not it came from Sonoma or Napa. And even further than that, they'd ask questions like, is it from Stag's Leap or Alexander Valley? Um, and I think people are starting to understand sake uh, in a bit more of a sense as to where it comes from. So it's important. We're going to reference this map maybe a couple times throughout the, throughout the slideshow. We can bounce back and forth. In general, um, history here starts a little over 2,000 years ago. Um, in each of the 47 prefectures of Japan, you'll find uh, at least one Kura, uh, which is a sake brewery. Uh, there's over 30,000 producers in the Meiji era uh, from 1868 to 1912. Uh, this era is important because it marks the beginning of industrialization for Japan and a move away from European colonization. Of course, after World War II, uh, we see a significant drop down to about 4,000 uh, producers. And today, there's only about 1,500. Uh, thanks, obviously, in large part to, uh, to wartime issues and to, uh, well, uh, nuclear warfare. <clears throat> um, and of those 1,500, I think only about two-thirds are actually producing today. Uh, so it, it's gotten a bit more difficult to stand out uh, from a brewery perspective. Um, and so here you see first imperial brewer opened in 689 AD in Nara, Japan. In the 10th century, uh, the Inchiki is published, which kind of outlines the production of sake and normalizes it for people. By the 14th century, production here is commonplace. And again, modernization really arrives in the 20th century. Um, obviously, nuclear warfare on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in 1945. Um, Zinkoku Shinshu Kampyuke is the nationwide sake competition uh, that started in 1910. <clears throat> Important sub-regions for uh, sake brewers. Yamagata uh, has 51 breweries. They have to use rice and koji from Japan, only Yamagata water. Um, and so you'll see different sub-regions have some slightly different um, requirements to be able to label as such. Um, Hakasan Kikusake GI for breweries uh, Tengumai, Kikuhime, uh, Todorikawa, Manzaraiku, Takasago, and Ishikawa. It's in the Ishikawa prefecture. Todorikawa is probably the most famous of those, and I can show you here. Let's get sort of a, a, a layout again. Hokkaido here in the north, Kyushu here. Some of the most important ones, though, come from right around here in Kyoto, Hyogo. and the Ishikawa Prefecture is, you can see Yamagata here. Is it not listed on this map? Interesting, I'll point that out. I had to point out Hyogo here as well. Perfect. So I think it's also important to understand sort of um, the climate as it pertains to what area of Japan we're talking about. So here in the south and west of the country, uh, the breweries have a little bit of warmer climate, which creates a softer water, producing a rounder, richer style of sake. In the northern uh, sake producing areas, you see more leaner uh, styles because of the cool climates. And it's funny, we can sort of um, attribute that to wine production as well. We think of cooler climate wines as being leaner styles typically. 
uh, and warmer climate being rounder and richer, and it sort of falls into place with sake as well. Uh, Ishikawa and Yamagata GI are uh, globally recognized and they have AOC status, so that makes them stand out quite a bit more. Uh, in Niigata, you must utilize Niigata rice. Uh, we'll get into more specific rice strains as we move further down the slideshow, but that's an important one to recall. Um, in Hokkaido, it's got to be a 70% simuwai, uh, which is the amount of uh, rice grain remaining after milling has occurred. Um, and we'll get into some of these uh, more specific production methods here in just a moment as well. And it has to be June Mai, so no brewer alcohol can be added to it. Um, and then Saga has an annual judging, but there's no Simo Bwai uh, required. Subregions, um, Hiroshima, the Saijo Saki status is given if the rice is from Hiroshima. Uh, the water is untreated. Uh, it's sourced at the brewery, and the Simo Bwai is a minimum of 55%, which takes it beyond what you would think of for Daiginjo, uh, or excuse me, for Ginjo. And traditional methods are employed uh, for the production of it. Climate. Uh, here, diurnal shifts are really, really preferred because the starches collect in the center and it forms a really good uh, shinpaku, which is that starchy center of the rice grain. Uh, rice really loves sunlight. Cooler years create uh, a rounder, more definitive flavors of the rice in the final product, product here. We talked about rice varieties earlier in Niigata. <clears throat> uh, Japonica or Haponica is the subspecies for the best varieties. Uh, there's over 80 varieties that are recognized, but really the king of them all is Yamada Nishiki, um, produced first in 1936. And that little area that I kind of highlighted earlier uh, is Hyogo, that's the best production area for it. I'm gonna bounce back, pardon me, but you can see it's just right here, just north of Osaka and west of Kyoto. Sorry if this gets confusing from moving back and forth too much, please, uh, please let me know. Uh, uh, Nigata also, the uh, Gohiaku Mongoku is famous for lean and clean. Uh, colder temperatures, a lot of times you'll see Miyama Nishiki. So if we think about what we talked about with climate earlier, uh, more commonly you'll see Miyama Nishiki in the Northeast because those are the cooler temperatures, right? Uh, the oldest variety today that's utilized is Omachi uh, from 1859. In Iwata, you'll see Ginjina. And then Yamagata, you'll find the Wasanan. Uh, which is also the name of a, a pretty famous Kura uh, that makes fantastic sakes. A couple of mountains you might want to know. Uh, we've pointed out um, uh, Hyogo a couple times and there's Mount Rocco there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit further about why that mountain in particular is, is important moving forward. And then further um, east, you'll find Mount Fuji and Yamanashi. Soils here, uh, we have to think about what sake rice prefers to grow in. And we think of rice paddies as being pretty well flooded. And so here you're looking at silt, clay, and loam as they prefer uh, to retain water in those flooded paddies. Weeds can be a really big issue uh, throughout the growing season. Um, we have to be important, uh, very, very mindful about wind damage. Uh, if you think of a, a rice stalk, of course, it's very top heavy. And if it's overly well nourished, it has a tendency to bend or break under its own weight if the winds can be too too high. Uh, production techniques, the first thing we really need to talk about is fermentation. Um, and this is where uh, sake is probably the most unique beverage in the world in that uh, it has what, what is known as multiple parallel fermentations all occurring at the same time. But what does that mean? Well, there is no sugar in a rice grain, right? So um, what you're trying to do is get to the center of that rice grain, to the starchy center, so that you can convert that starch into a sugar, which will then convert into an alcohol. So you've got multiple fermentations happening all at once. Um, today, the advancements in tanks, stainless steel, and ceramic lining have really limited bacteria. Um, you see more mechanized rice milling uh, some genetically modified rice strains and yeast strains that have really improved production. Um, with sake, we can kind of think about the Raheitska boat when it comes to beer production. Um, we know that one as being, right, uh, three, uh, really four uh, ingredients for beer. For sake, it's five ingredients. It's rice, water, yeast, koji mold, which we're going to get to momentarily, and then brewer's spirit, which would be that added alcohol that doesn't necessarily affect 
the end alcohol or ABV of the sake as much as it makes more uh, of a rustic style, I think. Um, that brewer's alcohol is known as Jozo, and it's normally distilled from uh, rice or beet sugar. It's typically unaged, it's colorless, and really flavorless, intended to be. And now it legally may not exceed 95% ABV. We think of um, things like Aguardente and production of port uh, and down in Sherry. This is a pretty high ABV, uh, but here typically it's, dis it's diluted down to about 30%. Uh, so you're not using that super high alcohol, uh, brewer's alcohol. Harvest or rice uh, actually occurs in the autumn. And this is important to know, I think, because in September, they start to harvest in the north because they're trying to avoid any freeze issues. But it's significantly later in the south. In Kyushu, you might see as late as mid-October. Um, and these are going to affect the production dates that we look at uh, momentarily. But the northern styles, once again, much more lean. <clears throat> so typically the North, because they're harvesting in September, is capable of utilizing this year's harvest. Now in the South, they'll use a previous year's harvest that's been in temperature controlled storage. So after the harvest is super critical to get the drains, gr uh, the grains dry as quickly as possible to avoid any rot issues. Now the rice grains here are sorted into five categories of size. I don't know how important it is to recall all of these terms specifically, but just to kind of have an idea of why this is done. Um, the larger sizes are Santo, Nito, and Ito, and then Tokuto and Tokujo um, are the smaller sizes. Does the harvest impact the potential sugar, sugar similar to grapes? You know, John, I don't think it necessarily does because we're talking about a starch that has to be um, uh, converted into a sugar first and foremost. Um, <clears throat> Tokutai Meiso Shu is premium sake and it's got to be made from one of these different categories of sizes that we see here. Uh, there's no preservatives, coloring, flavors, or fragrances allowed at this particular level. And then sake making actually begins here in the winter. Um, and we'll talk about uh, sort of the brewing year here in just a minute. Uh, milling machines really appeared in the 1930s. Uh, to help mill down to much lower simubuais. It takes about 50 hours to mill away that first 50% of a rice grain. To get another 15%, it takes another 50 hours. So it is an extremely exhaustive uh, process in order to get to these really, really small simubuais, and they're relatively unknown as to whether or not it's worth your time to get there. Um, once it's milled, the rice will actually sit for about two weeks to absorb more moisture so that it can breed, uh, breed that koji mold. Uh, winter weather really keeps the fermentations cool and long. We think about uh, original discussions of like champagne or, or burgundy and those cool long fermentations that occur over the, over the course of the winter because they just keep their cellars cold. We could think of that in the same sense with sake. <clears throat> uh, rice then is soaked in the mornings to absorb more moisture until it's about 30% or so above its initial uh, where it began with moisture. It gets steamed for uh, about an hour to break up starch molecules. It adds 12% more moisture. At, at this point, 100 grams of koji will produce a single tank of sake. Uh, koji also aids in the production of other products from Japan that we think of soy sauce, miso, and mirin, uh, which I think is important. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> For sake production, a particular strain of koji that's yellow koji is utilized. Uh, for shochu, they'll utilize white uh, and black. <coughs> the koji rests for about 24 hours and it's moved to um, a temperature controlled system of wooden boxes and trays that help to distribute the mold evenly. A couple of days later, it's removed from the muro. Uh, to stop the spread and act as a yeast starter. <clears throat> so at this point, um, about 25 kilograms of koji to 37 kilograms of kakamai. Kakamai is um, non-koji rice, essentially, are combined in a tank with about 80 liters of water. Um, lactic acid can be added to prevent other bacteria. Traditionally, this was done uh, with a couple of different methods. Uh, kimoto, which is also kind of funnily known as pole ramming. These guys would stand around uh, in unison, sing a song, a kimoto song, and there'd be six people around the vat um, 
singing this song and in unison batonage, basically stirring the lees, so to speak, up to about 10% alcohol where it can no longer survive. Now on the Yamaha method, uh, which is very similar, these are both very wild styles of sake. They have a tendency to be a bit more gamey. Um, batonage is foregone and the lactic bacteria form on the top of the moto. <clears throat> so those are sort of natural yeast methods, so to speak. Um, so Cujo method introduces lactic acid. So you're just chunking the lactic acid into it, shortens the time needed to create the moto. Uh, Bodai moto adds steamed rice to raw rice and water to encourage natural production of the lactic acid. This came about around the eighth century. And then an important uh, uh, production point is the Sandan Shikomi. Uh, which is a three-stage process with the addition of koji, kakamai, and water after lactic acid is done. Um, the stages for the Sandan Shikomi are Hatsuzo, um, <clears throat> brings Orori, which is dancing fermentation, Nakazo, and Tomezo. Uh, by the end of the Shikomi, uh, around 1,310 liters of water, 200 kilograms of koji, and 800 kilograms of rice will be fermenting. And this mash will actually run for about 20 to 30 days. So it takes anywhere from 30 to 60 days to make one batch of sake. And if we think about those northern climates that are, or excuse me, southern climates that are harvesting in, um, you know, mid to late October, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to get in under the gun for that particular year, which is why they utilize sake from the previous vintage, so to speak, or the previous year to produce their, their final product. At this point, Maromi begins. Um, this is the main fermentation. So multiple par parallel fermentations will continue until stopped or until naturally ending. And at this point, uh, the Kurabito or the sake or the uh, Kuramoto, the, the sake brewer, um, needs to pay special attention to alcohol, residual sugar, bacteria, and temperature. Uh, they can utilize jackets like we see in wineries that are glycol tubes um, for more control here as well on temperature. So this is where we start to get into differences in style, I think, and that's when we get to pressing. Yes, the, the fermentations have a lot to do with it. We can see gamier styles. We can see different yeast strains, different rice strains. Uh, pressing, though, I think is an important one for us to look at. So after fermentation, the rice is removed from the kasu, uh, most commonly with an accordion-like compressor. Called an asakuki, uh, though more delicate styles employ a box press called a fune. The only issue that you run into with a fune um, is that you have a much higher risk of oxidation. So these would be much finer styles because they have to really pay attention to them. Uh, Shizuku is the most delicate style. This is the drip press sake. Um, sometimes they use a teardrop or a gravity pressed or a fukurutsuri method using a, a sort of a hanging bag uh, known as a sakabukuru. It's a 15 liter bag that will actually produce six liters of free run sake. Um, so these are sort of your most sought after uh, delicate styles. The remaining of it will actually be pressed. And so once it's pressed, it can go straight into the bottle, uh, known as shibaritate, or fresh squeezed, essentially. Uh, more commonly, though, it, it sits in tank for 60 days at a cool temperature. <clears throat> Here we can think of um, champagne production and the uh, cuvee, the taille, and the rebeche. Uh, you've got a first run, a middle run, and a final run. <clears throat> so the first run is arabishiri, which is barely cloudy. The middle run is actually the best, and that's nakagumi. And then the sime, uh, which is typically unused, are the three categories of pressing here. Uh, you can filter. Um, if you do non-charcoal filtered, it's known as muroka. Um, so typically, though, filtration occurs through char charcoal. Pasteurization is kind of a funny thing with sake. I think some of us may be familiar with namasake. Um, but it can happen at different times, which make the final product quite different. Um, so typically it happens once it's in the tank and once it's in the bottle at 65 degrees. So it gets pasteurized two different times. Uh, and that's known as hirezake. But if it's only pasteurized in the tank, it's called namazume. And if it's only pasteurized in the bottle, it's called namachozo. Um, so unpasteurized completely is called namanama or namazake or hanama. And those are exceedingly rare to find here in the United States uh, or possibly even outside of Japan. The date of the bottling is actually what's labeled on the sake bottle, not the date of the production. So they could tank age for a period of time that's actually unbeknownst to any of us, uh, although it's only typically two to six months at below freezing temps. And again, you have to really pay attention to it being in an anaerobic environment. Uh, so the BY, the brewing year, actually runs from uh, uh, July 1st until June 30th. 
uh, oddly enough. So uh, if we think about, right, the harvest occurs in September, October, um, then you start to produce the sake over the course of the winter. Uh, you give it a, you know, two to six months um, aging time, and then you bottle it up hopefully by July the 1st. Most of these sakes are intended to be consumed in the first six to 18 months of their lives. Here's a really good infographic. Um, I can't remember, I think I, I lifted this from Guild Psalm too. <clears throat> Don't tell anybody. Um, that kind of showcases uh, the production of sake, and it starts here with the brown rice. Um, then you mill it down, and this is a really good kind of a, a look at how once it goes through these big milling machines, which typically if you've ever seen like a diamond, uh, there's a jewelry polishing um, <clears throat> uh, machine. It's sort of the same way. And you get down to the starchy center here. You then soak it, you wash it, and you steam it. And this starts to make that koji mold begin. And then it helps to get the yeast starting. You add a little bit of water, yeast starter, koji mold, and, and, and the starchy center. And you get your fermentation kicked off and going. Then you press it. You decide to filter it, whether it be uh, drip press through to charcoal filtration. Um, you pasteurize it the first time. We talked about this uh, and tank method, before tank method. You can add a little more water to help dilute the al alcohol content, and then you pasteurize it again while it's in bottle, that namachozo style. Bottle it up, and you get your final product. Ingredients here, uh, water is really 80% of the final product, and I think it's really important. We're going to talk about one particular water source, uh, but groundwater, mountain runoff, and river waters are all extremely common, and the, the clarity and cleanliness of each water is critical to the final product. The best locations are in Hyogo, where that Mount Roko is, Hiroshima, and Kyoto. Uh, Mount Roko produces the, uh, the shrine water, uh, also known as Miyamizu. Uh, which is utilized in 25% of all the sake in the country. So that's a, a critical style of water that goes into sake. Uh, low iron waters actually help to avoid oxidation. Uh, low manganese avoids discoloration. High potassium and magnesium uh, aid stabilization. And Borat wants you to remember that Kazakhstan is the number one exporter uh, of, potassium, of potassium. Don't forget that. Uh, and then harder waters actually yield uh, a faster fermentation. Yeast. Um, so about half the breweries are utilizing number seven yeast, discovered by Miyasaka Brewery in 1946. Um, but there's several different yeast strains that are out there. Uh, if you see one ending in 01, if you actually see a yeast strain at all labeled anywhere, uh, it probably means that somebody is uh, trying to draw attention to the fact that they're utilizing it. 01 added to it means that it's non-foaming, so you can fill the tanks to the top without having any fear of them overflowing. Uh, number 15 is pretty common in the nor northern states uh, because it's cold weather hardiness and it's drawn from uh, Gekka Bijan flour. Other yeasts you might see YK 2911, Saitama 86, F701, CEL 19, Alps yeast, and Coro. Okay, <clears throat> this is where we sort of get into um, the things that you might want to know for those of you that are going to continue to study for whether it be for an examination setting or, or just for uh, ability to talk about certain things with sake production. Uh, here are the basic terminology items that you, you may want to familiarize yourself with. Uh, the number one would be Kura, which is a sake brewery. And beyond that, uh, at the Kura, the sir, uh, sake brewer himself is known as the Kuramoto, and then his workers are the Kurabito. Uh, sake itself is a generic term in Japan that just means alcohol. So if you were to walk into um, uh, an, uh, an izakaya in Japan and ask for sake, um, you may or may not be getting a rice-produced uh, beverage. You might get uh, something else. Uh, what they call um, <clears throat> Japanese alcohol uh, is the most common term in Japan for what we know as sake is nihonshu. And you'll hear that, that term again here momentarily. Uh, clear alcohol there is called seishu. Uh, we talked about that white heart of starch at the center of a rice grain earlier, and that's called the shinpaku. Um, infant seedlings for rice are called ne. Uh, the remaining leaves after the production and cooler vintages have lower, warmer, higher, and leaner is called kasubwai or kasu. And then your rice grains are known as ine. 
Uh, the polishing machine that we've referenced a couple of times is called a Saimaki. Uh, we talked about the uh, brewery worker, the Kuribito. Uh, the milling process, we called Sima Bwai, the amount of uh, rice remaining after polishing, but the Sima is actually the milling process, and it comes from the Sima Kai, right? Um, Hakamai is white rice that's been milled, so you've taken away that brown uh, rice uh, husk. Um, Nuka is flour or what has been milled away from the hakamai, okay? Uh, we mentioned the simobuai, the lower percentages are questionably a little bit better, but that's the amount of rice remaining after polishing. Um, <clears throat> stylistically, kauri is an aromatic, fruity, and floral style. Aji is textured, savory style. The toji is the brew master of the brewery. Um, and then Toji Shudan or Toji Ryuha are schools or guilds for studying the production of sake. There are currently 26 throughout Japan, which is pretty cool. Um, Karashi Kikan is a cooling period after steaming in the, in the product. Um, Moto or Shubo is the yeast starter rice. The Koji Muro is the yeast room. The Kakamai is the non-Koji rice that goes to the bottom of the tank that we mentioned earlier. Uh, koji mai, uh, excuse me, koji mai is the koji rice that sits at the top and it's sprinkled with koji. Um, this is typically a pretty important one. The aspergillus orze is the yellow koji used in the production of sake. So this is the yeast strain utilized for the production of sake. Uh, a masu is a 180 milliliter cedar box that you'll see in quite a bit of Japanese restaurants. Um, unfortunately, here in the state of Texas, they're illegal to pour into a wooden box. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. But this is uh, a throwback. It was a measurement of, uh, of rice, essentially. People would scoop out their rice measurements, and uh, eventually it turned into the measurements of how we uh, talk about sake and produce it. Uh, koku is a 180 liter measurement for tax purposes. Um, Kiipan is rice from a single place of origin. So this is typically only reserved for your Junmai, um, and I would even uh, venture to say that your higher end Junmai. Uh, Jumai, of course, no brewer's alcohol is added to the sake. Uh, different um, <clears throat> uh, milling processes can give you Junmai, Junmai Ginjo, and Junmai Dai Ginjo. Um, Arukoru Tinka or Ruten is the brewer's alcohol that's been added. Here you'll see uh, Hanjozo, uh, Ginjo, and Dai Ginjo. So you, you remove that Junmai uh, from the beginning of those when you add brewer's alcohol. If there's no milling requirement to it, uh, it's just called Futsushu, and this actually represents about three quarters of the production throughout Japan. Uh, for Hanjozo, of course, you have to add brewer's alcohol, but the Simobuai is a minimum of 80%, so pretty uh, pretty loose here. Uh, for uh, Junmai, you have to state the Simobuai. Uh, there's no minimum, although 70% is technically the standard. Uh, tokubetsu, or special, essentially, whether it's Hanjozo or Junmai, uh, it's got to be 60% simobuai, or it's got to diverge from the nor normal practices. Uh, Jumai Ginjo is at 60%, and Dai Ginjo is at 50%. <clears throat> there are different styles here. Um, Amazake is kind of low alcohol, sweet, kanji textured, uh, sometimes given to children to get them to start enjoying sake. Tarazake is barrel aged. Uh, koshu is made in one brewer year and sold in another, or aged sake, essentially. Uh, Ogoshu is made more than one brewer year previous, or extra aged. And then Genshu is undiluted. So um, less than 1% ABV is actually affected by dilution. So you can actually get a string of words on a uh, particular bottling of sake that can be rather confusing. We used to carry one that was a Yamahai Baroka Nama Genshu. And what that meant was that it was natural yeast. Um, it was not fermented through char or filtered through charcoal. Uh, it was undiluted and it was only pasteurized one time. I think it was a, a namachozo. So it, it, you can string together as many terms as you want in order to explain exactly how your sake uh, should taste and, and the final product actually is. Um, I think it's important to state, I didn't put this on here, uh, but craft sake is known as jizake. Um, and that was a question that we saw. Uh, or maybe we saw this year at Master's Theory. Uh, unregulated styles, um, nigori, which is probably one of the most popular styles here in the U.S. and Japanese restaurants. Uh, this is bottled on the lees. It, it was actually deemed in e illegal in the 19th century due to ambiguities and production methods. 
Uh, sparkling, uh, this is where they arrest fermentation at 8% ABV and, and they add uh, liquor de tirage, a rice-based alcohol added. Uh, akazake, which is red sake, it's unapproved red rice grains, or you can uh, by use the ash or red koji. Uh, kijoshu, uh, which is junmai shu, uh, is used after shikomi in lieu of water. Uh, Sengoji is 100% koji, no steamed rice. And then tomizu is an ancient method with a one-to-one -one water to rice uh, ratio, so much broader style. Uh, we mentioned Nihonshu earlier as being sort of what the most common name for sake in the country of Japan is. Uh, the Nihonshu Do is the sake meter value, uh, otherwise known as the SMV. So this is density of sake compared to water. So it's 10 times more precise than the Baum, although it's unregulated. So it ranges from negative four to plus 14. The higher uh, the number is, the drier it actually is. So your sweeter styles will be in the negative. Uh, <clears throat> amino acid, lower volume equals more delicate styles. I think that's important to note. Uh, food pairing, uh, the more delicate styles, you probably would wanna use with sushi and other raw fish. And then there's more round and supple styles we talk about. A good example is that Yamaha Moroka Nama Genshu um, that we had, uh, that I used to pour, that's very round and powerful, great with robotic grilled dishes. Uh, storage and serving with sake is absolutely critical. These are extremely delicate items. Um, so you wanna keep them away from the sun, you wanna keep them at constant temperature and you wanna keep them right side up. Um, hine is a term for old or tired sake and that's not something you prefer to serve to your guests. Uh, hot sake now is non-traditional. Uh, the refinement of styles has developed enough to where people want to serve colder, more delicate styles. And warm is acceptable for richer styles, but certainly not hot. Like It can be warmer, but not hot. Um, the little ceramic carafe that you see that a lot of people put hot sake into in Japanese restaurants is called a tokuri. Uh, ochoko is a term for a small porcelain vessel. Um, and this would be something that you drink the sake actually out of. Um, there's actually another one called, oh, here it is. Kiki Choco uh, for formal assessment. <clears throat> uh, earthenware is called Sakazuki and they're both utilized for drinking. Uh, and pouring your own sake is just considered bad luck. It's not, uh, uh, it's not necessarily, well, this actually should be changed probably. Pouring somebody else's sake is considered good luck. Pouring your own isn't necessarily considered bad luck. Uh, laws for production of sake, the maximum ABV is technically 22%. Um, there's a few misleading terms that are unlawful. So Ichiban, which means number one, uh, Daihyo, which means leading or not allowed. Um, the following has to be labeled. Ingredients, the volume, the product type, both the Nihonshu and the Seishu are both permitted, the bottling date, the brewery name and address, the alcohol by volume, and a warning about sales to a minor. You'll notice that there's something different. Uh, there's no uh, requirements we talk about pregnancy or anything like we say here in the United States. Commonly labeled styles you find are Junmai, uh, Nama, Simubai, the origin and the type of rice. Uh, great producers, um, Hakuro Kuse uses a polishing machine whose rolls are made from diamonds. When they polish down to 7%, it's known as their Super 7 Junmai Daikinjo. I can't imagine how long it must take to get down to that. I tasted an, an 8% at the Saki Professional course in 2010 or so, and, and they were talking about how long it took. And it's insane to get down to that. Uh, Choryo and Nara for, for tar, Taruzake. Um, Darumi Masamune for Koshu. Tsukinu Katsura for Ogoshu, 50 year aged, crazy. Uh, and then for some of the best Shizuku or those most delicate styles, Tintakakuni's Silent Stream, uh, and then Divine Droplets by Kojima Shoten. Uh, the Hyogo Prefecture, the Shrine Water uh, is right next to it. You'll see that in Hakatsuru, uh, Ozeki, Shochikubai, and Kikumasamune, which are some of the, the bigger names that I think I've actually seen out here in the market too. Uh, and then, uh, oddly enough, somebody's using Malolactic, which is Bunraku. And they do um, uh, remuage style sparkling wines. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, awesome. That's my show for today. Any dire questions about sake? Was this helpful? Is it 
too confusing, too in depth. Very helpful. Cool. Thank you, Amanda. Um, awesome. Some housekeeping, real quick. Real quick. Excuse me. I am in on a flight next week. Um, I land at 9.40. I might change our time to like 11 or 11.30. I'll be returning from New Orleans. And let's just take a look at uh, next week's presentation. South Africa. I've got that ready to rock. So um, keep an eye out. There might be a change as far as the, the start time for next week. I'm going to try to make it by 11 a.m. But again, I'll be getting off of a flight from New Orleans and, and heading back home and trying to get settled in uh, before I kick this thing off. Uh, and I'll, I'll update you all on beer and cider when we can get that um, wrapped back around and put into, into uh, a logical presentation. Uh, in the meantime, thanks everybody. I certainly appreciate your attendance and, and patience and uh, attention to detail on this. If you have questions you want to further talk about sake and the production of it, please send me a note. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and upload this presentation to this particular uh, meeting invite, um, and we'll keep keep on moving along. Cheers, gang.